Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking time to, to call in. Um, I think the most important thing is to get an overview of what's happening. Uh, so I was going to turn it over to Meg. Do you want to uh, have everybody open their meeting? Yes. After each board, right? So make a motion to open the Deerfield Board of Health Select Board meeting for uh, September 4th at 12.08 p.m. Dave, do you second that? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, how about Conway? Or lately. Does everyone else have a quorum? Is there anyone else with a quorum besides Deerfield? Sunderland does not have a quorum. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Caitlin. Yep. How about um, Conway? Do you have one? It looks like Connie and, and um, Carl are on for sure. Mm -hmm. And Veronique is on. So Conway, why don't you open your meeting? Somebody unmute and open the meeting. Anybody? Donnie? Veronica? Remy, can you open uh, unmute and open your meeting? Or Carl? What are we going to, um, Veronique, why don't you take it? Excuse me. Just wanted to put in, um, this is Marie Eichen. I'm from Conway. I'm on via phone. Okay, great. Oh, can you open your meeting? Open your meeting, Marie. You just have to make a motion to open. Okay, I, I make on. the motion to open. Anybody want to second that from Conway? Yeah, I'll second it. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> Thank you. I would take that as unanimous. Yep. Okay, Fran, is there anyone besides you in Waitley on? I'm on, I'm Rebecca Jones. I'm another board of- Oh, hi, Becky. Um, hi. Becky, can you and Fran open your meeting? Can we open it? Yes. Um, yes, we can, right, Fran? He's muted, but yes, I would say so. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I, I'm actually, I don't know if he posted it. Uh, well, just open your open meeting. Just anyway. to be safe. Yeah, just to be Make safe. Motion, open it. Op open Somebody it second it. Okay. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I'm sorry what you're saying. All right. Yes, I, I vote to open it and hopefully Fran will second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I take that as unanimous too. So, okay, thank you for waiting. I'm sorry I had such problems with my computer. But anyway, um, I'm going to turn this over to Meg right now, just to give you an update and, and get everyone on the same page. Hi, Meg. Hi there. Uh, so now, um, so in terms of what we're doing the one of the biggest things and i did share this out to i tried to get it to every member of um the each uh local board of health last night is the community health metrics a draft of what data we are looking at um that that would be used for decisions about closing a school or reopening a school um and I don't think we are going to go through the whole slideshow here today, um, though I'm certainly happy to open it up and look at some slides um, if people have questions. Um, I did add, um, and I wanted to point out for those that ha haven't seen it, I did add um, Franklin County data. Uh, the Public Health Institute of Western Massachusetts has taken it upon themselves to provide data for the four Western counties. Um, and which is, which is helpful. And I'll, if I can do yeah, this, yeah, I will yeah. share my, well, I, I can share my screen for those who have video. Um, 
I think I can share. Sorry, I'm not usually the one who's doing the share my screen, but let me see. I'm going to show you um, the Franklin County data um, that came out. Um, are, are people able to see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so these these data are updated. Um, these data, the source of the data, are uh, the Department of Public Health, and they take the the weekly data update from DPH. Um, and then they aggregate it and do the calculations, the statistical calculations for our county. Um, and it's two-week rolling averages. They've included at the top um, which the current uh, two, what the current two-week period is defined as. Um, so these data go through August 29th. Um, and then the prior two-week period, which actually does overlap by a week. So they have these, these are overlapping time periods. But it gives us data that we're not able to get from the state uh, daily dashboard or the weekly update or even from the um, color-coded map that they have uh, to indicate the level of risk in the community. Um, and uh, the things that I look at um, and I think are most um, are important for us, I wouldn't say most important, um, is the percent positive tests for the last two-week period. Um, Franklin County is at 0.31% of tests are coming back um, as positive. Massachusetts, when they did this slide, was just over 1%. Um, and then we can also see our average daily cases per 100,000 population. So they've taken the data, they've done the, uh, uh, an adjusted um, population adjusted calculation, um, which for our small communities with small numbers of cases and small populations is, is important. Um, confirmed cases, deaths, and then just the number of tests. Um, and as you can see, those who, who can see, um, they have indicators to flag if the statistic, um, the measure has gone, is increasing. Um, an equal sign is, is really that there's little variation that would be considered statistically significant and then um, there's no downward arrows right now on our data. Um, and then if you scroll down on this page, which I will do. Um, Meg, they can do I just interrupt you for a minute? I, yes. I just, I just want to make sure that people understand that we had significantly more tests. We went from 3,886 tests to 5,183, but our percent positive tests were basically flat. So that yeah. to me mm -hmm. is a very good indicator that although the virus is circulating, we're doing fairly well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, and Meg, I posted this link and the link of your the metrics there on the chat. So if people want to go there, they can do their own thing. I, didn't, I don't know if you didn't see me put that up there. Yeah, okay. You. Okay, and I did I did email a link to this Franklin County data page um, as well as a link to the slideshow um, in the last days. Um, but if I scroll down on this, um, they they and it's the top uh, the top display um, gives a snapshot of the last two two week periods. And really because they overlap, it's the last it's sort of a snapshot of what's happened over the last three weeks. When you scroll down on this page, um, you get a you get to see the, um, tables, uh, graphs for each uh, for the last four periods, the last four two week periods. And again, these do overlap, so they're not discrete periods. But it gives you a sense of what's happening with confirmed COVID cases in Franklin County. It gives you a sense of what's happening with the average daily cases, uh, and again, that's per hundred thousand for a two week period. Um, and then the percent positive. And as Carolyn said, you can see that really since um, early August, um, end of July, really, uh, end of July, early August, we've been fairly flat in terms of the percent positive um, of tests coming back. Um, and then this is, a, this is just the number of tests. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point because I 
when I'm sharing, I cannot see anybody. And somebody is asking to be let in. Okay. Um, so that's a snapshot of the regional data that we now have access to. Um, and I have, um, through Phoebe Walker at the FERCOG, have been talking, um, you know, I've been giving her feedback and um, talking with her about these data. So if there's something else that would be useful um, to our towns or, or to, the, to the Franklin County as a whole, we can give that feedback. And they've been very responsive and interested to know what are the data that would be helpful. Um, and if they can provide it, I think they're working to do that. Um, and I know, Carolyn, when we talked recently, um, you pointed out that on an earlier version of our data, um, we had had something in there for um, the turnaround time for tests. And I know um, that's, a, that's a grave concern of a lot of people is if we're sending people, staff or students home to get tested and uh, we're not able to get a response um, or, or a result uh, in a timely fashion, that, that that's going to have an impact on the contact tracing and on the follow-up for um for anybody who is, is then eventually determined to be positive. And so, but when we were looking at how to get that data, we couldn't be sure that we could have access to that data. Um, but in talking with Carolyn, she she has has asked that we consider putting that back on um, as, as one of the things that would be a flag for us. If, if the local board of health, or if we knew anecdotally that test results were delayed greater than 48 hours, that that would be a flag. And if it was greater than 72 hours, then, then that would act be a really a real concern in our ability to do the, for the, for the public health nurses to do the follow-up of a positive case and the close contact um, and basically interrupt any, um, any transmission that might be happening. Just, uh, Meg, just to uh, do a little bit of explanation, there is availability of the tests, there is capacity to do the tests, and the turnaround time right now is averaging between 24 and 36 hours. So it's perfectly okay. However, there's these ability to have um, some of the components of the tests, either the swabs or the reagents are not available then all of a sudden the testing is stopped and it could be a week to 10 days. So I, I feel like this is way beyond us as local boards of health to monitor and that it should be the HMCC, the Health Medical um, um, Collaboration Coalition that would, would be able to do this for the four counties and or somebody like that, somebody on the state level. So what we should do is have make sure that they know that they have to report to us, but that we have developed some kind of policy. That if the policy is we have all of a sudden going beyond the 48 hours, then we need to be able to shut down to a certain that testing is again becomes available, and you shut down for a day or two to see what the if the conditions would change because it. Nobody has control over this. So if we have a policy that would be triggered, then I think that this this would be handled. This, to me, is the one issue that has not been uh, addressed. I mean, we still have time, like 10 days or so, to figure out what, who is going to do what. But I think that this would be a way to handle this, is if we had developed a policy in response to the test turnaround. It's not test capacity, it's not test availability, it's the reagents and the test components that shut this down. Yep, and that is a, really, it's a Board of Health discussion. So um, my question is, who, who do we, um, we know that tests are done in, in several places, right? So how do we know who's got what and I mean, is it an aggregate of all of them, or are we looking at one facility? I mean, you have community health that does the testing, you know, hospital. hospitals, that kind of thing. How do we know on a on a Western Mass level, you know, because if, if one place is out, but Holyoke has a thousand parts of reagent or something and can ship it up, or how do we know what that is? I, I don't want to close down school if 
if it's mm-hmm. truly, um, you know, it's just a matter of getting something in the next day, but because that's really disruptive for teachers and everybody else as they're trying to plan out. But if it is truly like Western Mass is out of this stuff for a week, we're going to be, you know, we, and if we have cases, we have no way to turn it around. There's no way to do that quick reaction. My, my thought on this was to have the HMCC has a duty officer. So there's okay. somebody 24-7, and that you could set up a call to um, the hospital's uh, per, you know, Quest Laboratories mm-hmm. plus whoever else is handling the testing turnaround so that they would just do a mandatory call every day when they switch duty officers. And then if there was any problems, then they would just notify uh, a point person in each district, you know, like Union 38, we could make you, maybe you could be the point person or whoever. Sure. And, and so there is limited number of phone calls, limited number of uh, stuff, but it would be set up in a way that we could monitor it. And it wouldn't be a board of health responsibility because I feel like none of us can take on any more. Right. So I want to answer uh, Caitlin, uh, Fran, just one sec. I, Caitlin had a question that she put in the, um, the chat about where are the tests being administered. And in, uh, and in Franklin County, we have um, Bay State Franklin. We have the hospital. We have the community health center. Um, Tuesdays in Greenfield. Fridays, I believe, are in uh, Orange. Yeah. Um, we have Valley Medical Center. Uh, we are working on um, on test uh, test capacity. Um, University Health Services does testing. And um, Holyoke is now has a pop-up site, I believe, at HCC, um, which is is one of the Massachusetts pop-up sites for free uh, free testing. Um, and but then I students test spot like uh, doesn't feel well. Can what about they go to their pediatrician? What about Med Express? Right. Um, so and so, so how can we control who they are getting tested by and then what diagnostic, whether it's Quest or whatever? Well, we I guess I guess the short answer is we can't control where they go for their test. Um, and a lot of times it's based on who is their medical provider. Um, I think the Bay State practices generally are offering tests for their uh, patients the community health center is open to all, to all as is the HCC um, pop-up site. Um, Valley Medical, I presume, would be doing um, would be doing their patients as well. Um, and I, I, so I mean, I think the the, re- the recommendation if we send a student home who is symptomatic um, per the per the guidelines. Um, from DESE, and we now actually, as of last night, have additional guidance from the school health unit um, from DPH um, to integrate into our protocols. But um, they, they would they would be referred to get a test, um, and uh, the guidance does allow for if the doctor determines uh, it sort of essentially gives an alternate diagnosis um, based on a, a visit with that child, um, or it could be a staff person. Um, then that would, and we had, and we were provided with documentation of that, then this, then the, the individual could come back to school. Um, if, but I'm going to add the caveat is that they would come back to school when they were well, just as we would expect them to do at any other time. Um, if the test were negative or if they had an alternate diagnosis and in a conversation with Lisa, Recently, we were just talking about the role of the public health nurse versus the school and really clear that determinations of quarantine and isolation are made by the public health nurse. Um, and those really, um, you know, there's there's clear guidelines in terms of what's a what information is an actionable public health response, I think, is the term that we we often use. Um Whereas there may be decisions that the school makes um, that are more conservative um, if we're waiting for additional information. And, mm-hmm. uh, and that more conservative approach would be um, really a measure that the school could take to mitigate um, transmission or to, to get more information. 
Um, but quarantine and isolation would be, those determinations would be made um, based on the appropriate data by the public health nurses. Um, mm -hmm. And we would assist in providing close contact information and then uh, other assistance um, depending on the situation. Um, for the close contacts. Lisa, we've talked about that some, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to add anything, please do. Um, May I ask another question, Caitlin? Oh yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so it's kind of like a scenario thing then. So someone uh, goes to the nurse with uh, symptoms, uh, fever, cough, sore throat you know all that they get sent home to go to their provider they go to their provider so that's monday um their provider sees them possibly monday night maybe tuesday morning the provider says yeah why don't we get a test just in case because you seem to check off some of the boxes now that's tuesday they get a pro now school's open they get a provider, they get a test. The test comes back maybe Wednesday morning, maybe Wednesday evening. So now the school's been open Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Right. And we're getting we're getting out of that 48 hour sweet spot for close contact identification. Right. right. <laughs> so now they're home. They're home. So we don't have anybody else. Now it's Wednesday night. They get the test results back. They were positive. Right. Um, but they don't tell anybody till Thursday at 9 o'clock. They call in school at 9 o'clock. We got our test results. It's, you know, because they're not, you know, they, they're not going to make the phone call at 9 o'clock. So the school finds out 9 a.m. Thursday. That the student was positive. Caitlin, I just, I just want to be clear that it's not the the it person. Comes it comes to the board of health. We mm -hmm. get yeah. the communication immediately. So not, we're not waiting for a for a patient or a child mm -hmm. or a parent to get around to let us know. You know immediately. Well, immediately. What do you consider immediately? It goes into Maven, <laughs> and. It get Maven will get checked by your public health nurse when your public health nurse checks Maven. So, which is twenty four seven. I was going to say speak to that. Yeah, yeah. It's twenty four seven, but it's twenty four seven when. You... Thank you. Well, Lisa, I didn't you hear all of that. I said it, it, it's twenty four seven, but it's twenty four seven when your public health nurse opens up a computer. They get to shower. They get to go to the bathroom. Oh no, yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, I think um, in our experience, Caitlin, within the schools, and Lisa, we've worked with you on cases for a number of years in, in Conway and Deerfield, um, that it's generally we we get con confirmation of a case or a, or a lab result um, from, from the public health nurse. Um, occasionally, we get it from the family first, but... Um, but not always. And if we do get it from the family first, then it uh, our immediate call is to the public health nurse to say we were just shared this information. Mm -hmm. Lisa, do you want to, Lisa's unmuted and I know she's got to uh, leave the meeting shortly for another commitment. So I want to give her a chance to respond before she has to go. And I think Caitlin's points are really good in that there will be circumstances where you'll have a child in a school environment who um, maybe wasn't symptomatic when we, they were there, um, but might test positive and they'll need to be contact tracing back. Also circumstances where a family may report before we have, may report symptoms before we have test results. And as Meg was pointing out, there'll be different levels of decision-making. From a board of health perspective, we're actionable when we get that positive test result or we have knowledge of a con confirmed case. Um, but the school may know a kid is symptomatic with symptoms consistent with COVID and may need, for instance, or may get a report from a family member and may need to make decisions about actions taken within the school environment that are as an abundance of caution until 
a test result is available, and that's different decision making. Yeah. We do receive a an email notification every time there is a confirmed case by positive test PCR. We also receive antigen tests, um, which are also used for diagnosis sometimes. And we also receive antibody tests that shows past infection. Um, but they, there may be a lag time from when they're submitted, depending on the provider, till when they hit our system. So I think it's all the more important that these conversations are happening and that the schools mm -hmm. have strategies to address the issues before the local board of health receives that ping of that positive test. Right. Mm -hmm. Should we have the teachers be made aware maybe to check the symptoms, to look out for symptoms in the classroom of the other kids? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is well, now, if you think about the scenario, we've got the one kid out on Monday, they should be looking at the other kids Tuesday, Wednesday to see. Right. And I think, you know, part of part of what is definitely within the school's responsibility um, is for us to have the communication clear and the training clear for the teachers in terms of what are the symptoms that you would be sending a student down to the health office to get evaluated for, um, which we have that in place. Um, and just like we would in any normal school year, um, the teacher would ref refer the student to the nurse for the nurse to do the assessment. And then the nurse would determine whether the student would go into our medical waiting room and, you know, awaiting dismissal um, or if there was an alternate, um, you know, somebody told the teacher they had a stomach ache and the student came down and said to the nurse, you know, I've, I've got my I've got cramps. We're not going to send that child home, obviously. Right. Um, and the child maybe wouldn't say to the teacher the reason they had a stomach ache, that it would, they would just say they had a stomach ache. Um, for some students, there may be, you know, additional circumstances that the nurse would be aware of that the classroom teacher would not necessarily be aware of additional, uh, mm -hmm. plans for a student who maybe gets migraines. Um, and those migraines present a certain way, um, in terms of notif in terms of asking the teachers to do something different, if we've sent somebody home, I want to be really mindful and thoughtful about the sort of need to know idea, um, we don't, the, the teachers, the teachers are, are teaching and um, their, their responsibilities are, um, their plate is really full and we do have a nurse in every building. So it would be the nurse that would, you know, the student, any student of concern, whether we had sent somebody home or not, would always be referred to the nurse um, for an, for an assessment um, and for, you know, appropriate care and action. Um you know, I, I think in our small communities, especially, I want to be, I want to just be careful about any, any protected information. Um, certainly we would share information of, if we had concern about a student, we would contact the nurse for the town of residence of that student. If we sent somebody home that we were highly suspicious, maybe was going to come back as a positive test, we would want to let the public health nurse know, and we're able to do that under the current HIPAA guidelines. But um, I, I know this came up in a public health nurse conversation meeting earlier this week of just that fine line um, and need to be careful around confidential information and identifying somebody, especially in our small communities. Um, Fran, did you have more to say before? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to get back to the testing and the issues raised by Carolyn. Um, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, we got a report or I saw a report on uh, testing that somebody had done on a, with a, after a meeting with uh, the various hospitals and uh, other testing facilities. And they had um, said the times were quite different from what um, Carolyn mentioned, and I, I must say, I'm still concerned about the turnaround times, given what I've heard recently. Actually, at HCC, there was a turnaround time of 72 hours. Um, okay. One pixel test came back also at about six days recently. And so I'm not so sure this 24 to 36 hours is actually 
the average right now. And I think we should be trying to find out again, like someone did before, maybe it was Phoebe about actual testing times right now before we say, okay, it's a flag, but um, you know, we might have that flag right now. Actually. Right. Yeah. In, in terms of those data that was, um, those data were reported out at a meeting that Phoebe Walker had organized yeah. um, of the uh, representative from um, the area medical practices. Um, Carolyn, I think, you know, if, if I, I, I would leave it to the boards to decide to pursue seeing if the duty officer um, at the well, um, forgetting the acronym, uh, I apologize. Um, can 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 collect that data daily. It's not something that I see as it would be something the school would take on. No. Yeah, no, it's the HMCC. And I, what I would do is, um, I mean, I can verify, but I know we had just recently um, employees tested and they came back um, with uh, less than 30 hours. So um, I don't know exactly where they got tested, but my understanding is the, the turnaround is still pretty okay. But, um, you know, that's the problem. It changes. And so I think the HMCC, um, I think we should vote to request that the HMCC um, do that. And then that, and, and then we'll bring it up at the MAPCO board meeting next week and try to make sure that it does happen. Well, I'd, I'd make that motion. They pass the, the request and pass the HMCC with a um, with, with the task of kind of giving it a, a daily a daily update on on the lead times for for testing regionally. Mm -hmm. Any second? Second. Thank you. All right. Um, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor Aye. McDaniel. Aye. Good. Do we have a date uh, waiting for Dave? Uh, Dave, did you vote yes? I had Wolfram. Thank I you. I had John. And then, was that Bree that voted yes? Yes. Okay. And then uh, did everybody else, is there anyone against this? I think it's actually easier. All right, so there's an official vote by the town of Deerfield as well as this group um, to ask the HMCC to take this on. I, I, I will forward this on to um, the MAPCO meeting and put it on the agenda for our next meeting and, and make sure to try to get this sorted out because I feel like this is, I agree with Fran, this has to be sorted out and it's, and it's beyond us. I, I want to add, uh, Darius put something in the comment, but I don't know if everybody can see the comments. And just uh, if this is an important reminder that the elementary school schedules this fall as part of the rollout, um, their attendance is Monday, Thursday for one cohort or Tuesday, Friday for the other. Um, so they may, if they're exposed on a Tuesday, there'll be several days before their next in-person um, mm -hmm on-site learning, um, which which will make will make a difference in some cases timing-wise. So that I think is an important reminder. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's right. Nobody will be in school on Wednesdays anyway. Right. Not okay. at the elementary schools. There will be a, a small cohort at, at the, um, I believe, at the middle school on Wednesdays because in order to have the cohort small enough, yeah. Um, to be able to do it in the in uh, with maximizing the the distance between students and maintaining the six feet uh, minimal six feet um, that was necessary to do. Okay. So, are there other questions for uh, myself or for Darius about the school protocols and about? Uh, communication with the boards and the public health nurses. I know I reached out to everybody to make sure I had primary and secondary contact information, which I will I will put on one list and share. Mm -hmm. No, I, I just I can't thank you and Darius and everybody enough for um, you know all the boards of health for work, working on this together and trying to trying to get a good policy together to 
to protect our students and staff and, and get some education moving. So we'll, we'll keep learning, obviously. I mean, I just want to say that, you know, the school's position on this is not to bulldoze ahead. Um, it kind of, I think people are kind of feeling that way. I think the, mm. you know, the teachers um, associations kind of made us kind of, of the field, not ours directly, but in the state, across the state has kind of made this feeling that it's kind of bulldozing ahead all steam all steam forward without the consideration of health if there is any concern from the boards of health that we need to shut down we should shut down for a short period of time i'm saying this and i want to hear from you guys when when you have that concern if we get a blip on the radar and we don't have an uncontrolled blip on the radar right. there's nothing you can stop there's nothing in our way from stopping us from going remote for a couple of days assess the situation and, and it's, it's my belief that that's probably going to happen that way Mm -hmm. First time around, you yep. know what I mean? Because as we kind of this is a new, a new, I'll say a new frontier, no pun. Um, but you know that how we're going to be dealing with this and managing this moving forward. You know, if we don't have a vaccination for eight months, then this is going to be, um, it's going to be, this is going to look very different about how we move forward. But it's my expectation that we get in, uh, you know, the the numbers in our in our communities have been so luckily so low, but we're also we are functioning different because they're so low compared to communities that have had had higher numbers and had, I guess, more experience of working with numbers and in working mm -hmm. through it. So I just kind of want people to know that, that um, mm -hmm. we are putting together a hybrid schedule, which is, you know, controversially, what's in the best interest of students um, is to get them back and to be checking on their mental health and all the other kind of things that also affect our daily lives of people. So I just, you know, I just want to kind of put that out there that um, if people have concerns, um, or concerns about how we're doing it, I am open to it. Um, and it's the same thing for our teachers. If we have policies and procedures that don't make sense, let's just fix it. This is my right. first, this is my first pandemic. Um, you know, we're last, but you know, what I mean, we're going to have to work through some of the the moving parts of it. And so, the idea is to keep people safe. It's not it's not to bulldoze forward. So, that's just my speech. That's absolutely right. Thank you. And you know, in terms of the guidance that's out there from Desi and now from the school health unit. Um, you know, in, in our protocols, what, I, what I've looked at all along is, um, you know, what's the guidance um, where DESE was earlier in the summer where DESE was uh, different than the DPH guidance that the public health nurses and the local boards of health would be following. We, we, st we stuck with the board of health guidance um, rather than the DESE guidance. Um, and, you know, there are some instances where our protocols are more conservative. Um, than what the guidance requires. And, you know, one example of that is Desi, you know, says three to five, three to six feet. Um, we do six feet. There's the three feet's not not part of the discussion, the planning um, at, at the Frontier Union 38 schools. And so there will be other things where we will have information in our protocols that are more conservative. And it may be that as time goes on and we get some success and we get more experience with um, students back in the building and managing the situation, there may be things that we say, yeah, you know, this, this doesn't need to be as strict as this. Um, we, we can relax this. Or there may be things that we're getting feedback from you saying, you know, this isn't tight enough. This is putting us in a situation that feels like there's, unex you know, additional risk. Um, and then that feedback would, would, you know, would be incorporated into um, into our protocols moving forward. So, um, and I and I expect the guidance from DESE, DPH, and the school health unit to change again. Um, it's about every what ten days. There's new guidance, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's an evolving situation. So that's not. I don't mean to disparage you know any of the state organizations that are working you know uh, hard on this as well. It's it's an evolving situation, and so we're all doing our best to. To mitigate risk, risk and and you know prevent um, uh, prevent cases. Hmm. Hmm. I have a question on some protocols. It's Frank. Sure. Yeah. Um, so with the buses, do you intend to have some kind of log? I, I haven't read through your uh, complete protocols for the schools reopening, but. I don't remember seeing something like a log so that people would, or something that shows where students were on buses. If there is a case 
um, and the contact tracing has to take place, it wouldn't necessarily be in cohorts anymore. Correct. I think Darius is going to answer you, friend. So we're still working on the details of that, and it, it may seem like, wow, that feels late, but remember our first 10 days are remote, so we still have um, two and a half weeks to get that done, and I'm working, I'm also contract negotiating with Gripco Transportation as well. Um, right now, we're looking at, um, we only have about 15% of our students who have signed up for busing, so again, so that ridership's going to drop way down. Um, they're putting together the routes for me um, based on who signed up for busing, so um, mm -hmm. We are going to be following the protocols of where students are going to be, and they're going to be assigned seats. So we're going to know who's in what seat on which bus um, mm -hmm. and um, through attendance, know who's on which bus on, on which day. So, yeah, that's all being um, all being worked out, you know, following the, the DESE guidance on the staggered seating, the open windows, um, who's on which route um, mm -hmm. and based on. Based on the number of riders each bus, I have to see what I haven't seen what that looks like yet. I have a meeting next week with him on this, but um, I mean, we could have buses in some of the communities. The, the numbers are going to look. It's going to we're going to have a 42, 42 passenger bus with with ten kids on it. I, I, it's just how it's going to work out, and that's for the first time ever. That's wonderful. <laughs> you know, I've been hearing about it for years how the buses are not full enough, and um, now that's going to work to our advantage. Mm. Yeah. I have a question about the bus drivers. Will there be anyone on the buses that will help the bus drivers enforce mask wearing? Because I don't really understand how bus drivers can focus on the road plus monitor whether students are actually have the masks on. It's a good point. We also are um, looking at putting bus monitors on the buses that are going to need it. And what, what describes as need is the size and the number of passengers, um, capability of the bus driver. Uh, we have bus drivers with different skill sets. Um, and um, their, their clientele on the bus. We have buses that have been rowdier routes than other routes as well. So we are planning on um, lining up um, monitors, um, especially to start off the year to get the, the things in place. And as soon as we feel it's comfortable and everybody's following the rules appropriately, then we may be able to pull those monitors off. Um, but that's, that's the game plan in that area. Mm -hmm. Good. Um. So I had a question about PPE, Meg, because you were looking for um, supply of some things. And I mentioned that towns have a pretty plentiful supply on certain um, PPE. Um, is that still the case? And will you have enough for all your maintenance staff and your folks too that are, are not in classrooms per se? Sorry, my mic was off. Um, when we did our PPE calculations, we um, we did follow the the DESI um, sort of guidance or rubric for kind of I think of it as categories of staff and and really it's categories of risk. Um, so we have for all classroom teachers, um, we do have enough disposable masks um, at this time, and um, also face shields for additional protection for um, teaching staff. And then for those staff who are sort of more direct service providers or are likely to be in more um, close contact, um, so this would be um, early childhood uh, educators, um, it could be some of our related service providers, speech, uh, language, uh, OTPT, it could be some of our staff, uh, special ed staff who work in um, separate programs or who work with students um, within, you know, the, the regular educational program. So for, for certain, and those are going to be case by case determinations um, for, for just general learning activities of what additional PPE might be required. Um, we've done uh, training uh, and discussion with the early childhood staff earlier this week. I have a meeting in a little bit this afternoon with the SPED and the related service providers um, to talk about PPE for them. And, you know, really it comes down to um, a, a, of a risk category um, of, of what they're doing. So in a situation where we're not concerned about bodily fluids um, or close, close contact, um, the face, face mask and face shield um, would generally, generally be appropriate situations where there's toileting, uh, additional PPE um, would, would often be um, required. 
if somebody is able to independently do what they need to do, then it doesn't require additional. So we have enough for um, to get started for for those situations. Um, there's been conflicting information and guidance on the use of N95 masks and on the use of uh, the KN95 masks. Mm -hmm. um, the school health unit has come out with some clearer guidance, and that's consistent with the recommendations from Boston Children's around nurses um, or staff who are caring for somebody who is symptomatic um, would be wearing an N95 mask. And we have, um, we have ordered those. We have other situations where, again, out of an abundance of caution, we would want staff who are physically close proximity to, to students. And again, it's going to be a case-by-case -case determination to have a KN95 mask in addition to a face shield. So that's one of the categories of PPE that we're looking for from towns is some additional KN95 uh, for those staff. Um, and gowns, we have, we've ordered um, what seems like an inordinate number of gowns, but I imagine we will start going through them rapidly once we're open. So I guess that's a long answer to your question, which is KN95s would be helpful, <laughs> as would, um, you know, uh, I think we're okay right now on disposable masks and um, generally okay unless you have large size gowns um, on disposable gowns. Mm -hmm. And just a shout out, thank you, Waitley, you did donate um, a thousand K and 95 masks to the schools and a thousand of the surgical masks. So thank you so much from your stock, from your, I don't want to say stockpile, but your, from your, from your stores. Thank you. And I believe Deerfield has donated as well. So thank you for that. Um, and I know I've, I've, I've on my list to finish following up is Conway and Sunderland um, for additional PPE for those two buildings um, or, or portions to go to, to uh, Frontier as well. Um, is there has there special staff training on what PPE they're going to need for different kinds of um, contact with students? And also, is there a 90 day supply? That's the recommended amount you're supposed to have ahead for safety, for occupational mm -hmm. health and safety. Um, uh, in terms of 90 day, I've lost track of how many weeks of supply we have, quite honestly. Um, Lisa, I know we were following the DESI um, guidelines for for initial ordering. Um, so, and, and in terms of training, we've been, all, all staff were required before they came into the building when we reopened on August 26th, maybe, um, to complete a, a PPE training, a training module um, that did have, um, went through all of the PPE, included information about um, situations where staff would, would be advised to wear specific PPE. And then in addition to that, for those staff who need additional P who are, would, would be in situations where we would want them to have additional PPE on, we are doing, um, as I said, specific, um, meetings with those staff. And then the building based nurses are following up individually in those buildings and, and able to do demonstration and go through the, the actual donning and doffing of the PPE. I had another question about um, HVAC. And somewhere along the line, it popped up in our town. Um, are you guys implementing any of the guidelines for filters like MERV 13 or something like that for um, improving the filtrations for HVAC, and are you um, planning any other things like uh, UV light sanitizers? Yep, good question, Fran. Um, so we've, we've employed our HVAC right. company, which, which is Jamrog, um, and they've gone through, we pay, we pay for them to do an assessment of all five schools. They went through and gave me a preliminary report, um, and right. then um, to check air flows, um, exhaust and, you know, um, amount of uh, air exchanges per hour. Um, I got the preliminary reports um, and then we um, contracted for them to go through and fix um, everything that they can fix. And then they're gonna give us a follow-up report. The only follow-up report I have so far is uh, Deerfield. The other ones I'm expecting 
either today or they're going to write them over the weekend and I'll get them on Tuesday. Um, we should be in good shape uh, for Waitley Fran, where you're at. They, they got a glowing report out of the gate. Um, mm -hmm. Waitley Elementary School's HVAC system is um, mm -hmm. uh, is probably maybe it's the newest. Um, and mm -hmm. so we have um, ordered and um, they should be arriving any day, the MERV 13s um, to be exchanged and put into all the units. We've also ordered the ultraviolet lights, which won't come out um, and probably, we probably won't get them installed until probably the first week of October. Um, and those are for units that um, do not have direct air exchange to the, uh, there's classroom units, um, like the one behind me there, you can see that there. Um, and then there's units that cover multiple rooms. Those the UV lights will be going the ones that cover multiple rooms, basically your rooftop units. Um, so those UV lights protection will be put in there. Those have been back ordered and that's why this is a delay to October 1st. Um, I'm kind of also looking at it by the time we get to the end of October, a lot of those outdoor classes, the amount of time you'll be able to spend outdoors, I think people will be start migrating more be more probably time per day in, at, you know, by that point, and then we'll have those UV lights at that point. So um, that's what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if people want a copy of the final report when I get it, if you want me to send it to all boards of health, so you can take a look. Um, they are they're able to get the, the the big concern was that the two uh, exchanges per hour, which is with the it came up from some document somewhere. It's not code. I mean, you have to go dig through manuals to find it. Um, but we, we, I think we're able to reach those that number in just about all spaces in all buildings, um, all classroom spaces. Um, some of the smaller office spaces, they just don't have the don't have the infrastructure to do that, or the building wasn't designed to do that. And so that's gets to be very costly. So we are spending for those who play multiple roles. We are spending thousands upon thousands of dollars of fixing our HVAC. So um, it costs us um, it costs us thirteen thousand just to have the inspection to tell them what was wrong before they even started. Um, that's across the districts um, before they even started doing the HVAC repairs. And so you know it's going to eat up a, a a portion of that grant money that we got from the state to to mm -hmm. uh, fix all these things that really wasn't the wasn't the primary concern years past to have certain air flows and you know tighten belts and. Expensive mm -hmm. filters change multiple times a year, so on and so forth. Good, thanks. Mm -hmm. Tough. Are there other questions for Darius or I? I'm looking at time. We're at one o'clock, so I think we had figured about an hour for this meeting, but if there's other questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Well, I thought what we could do is go over the, quickly the list that came out with the letter from the um, Nurses Association. Um, I felt pretty comfortable with almost all the items. So, um, but there might be a couple questions for people and I would refer to um, Darius on a couple issues. I know we just discussed proper ventilation and circulation. My concern was that um, once we started closing up the schools that we did have the UV installed and it looked like um, that timing would work out. So the proper ventilation and circulation, I feel has been addressed significantly. Um, and and, we're, and, and it's, it is safe. And, um, and also understand in the ventilation things, they don't test with windows open. It's everything mm -hmm. without the windows. Windows is a bonus on any of those kind of things. They're, mm -hmm. they're a sealed room with their testing. Right, and the UVs would be installed once we had to close up the windows again. Um, assessing community resources for alternative school settings. I felt that none of us had the ability to, um, the kids were safest in the schools and that because of the hybrid um, cohort situation that we were not looking at any of our buildings. I mean, when they talk about alternative school settings, they're talking about libraries and senior centers. And um, unfortunately, none of us are in the position of having uh, better um, senior centers and libraries and um, town halls than, and it would be very disruptive to our town halls to have kids here anyway, but they are safer in the schools. So there was not anything to assess from a community resources for alternative school settings. Um, ensuring proper social distancing. 
Um, we have been 100% from day one saying we are going by DPH uh, distancing of about 28 square feet per student, which is your six feet uh, distancing. So that has been met. Standardization and availability of PPE. Again, Mega has did address that. We are absolutely 100%. Um, again, making sure PPE is available. Yeah, and uh, I, I hadn't seen Carolyn. I'm just going to comment that I hadn't seen these guidance. I think they came out on the 31st of August, and I saw them last night. So I haven't recalculated our numbers with the actual staff in the building to know where we are with that. 90 right. day that Lisa you were concerned about but I but we, we can did, we can look at that I think we're in good shape I think all the towns have significant stockpiles that would back up the schools if there was um, any kind of interruption of the delivery service so I felt all of us have been trying to squirrel away as much as possible to be anticipate any issues um, resources and infrastructure to support hand hygiene and mask wearing. We have all been, um, Dick Kalaszewski, I know, has inspected both Deerfield Elementary and Frontier to make sure that there was hand hygiene, um, you know, available, stations available. Now, I don't know about the other three elementary schools, but I do know here in Deerfield that that is the... Um, everything is available. Uh, could you uh, comment on that at all, Darius, on the other three um, elementary schools? Can you wait? Yeah. Oh, I think you're muted still, Darius. Can you just ask me again? Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted you to address, um, I know Deerfield Elementary and Frontier Regional have um, the, the hand hygiene and um, you know stations available. I do not know about the other three elementary schools. Could you just comment it, on yeah. that? So some of the things that we're having trouble getting is the touch-free stations. We have plenty of plenty of of uh, the alcohol-based um, sanitizers. So we have enough for each classrooms. We have wipes for each classrooms. We have cleaning stuff for each classrooms. Um, we, the, those freestanding stands is what we're waiting for. I saw, I know Frontier got theirs. Um, I don't know if they did. I know that was the one back thing that was back delivered. So in place of that, we're going to have to have desk stations where you, you squirt the thing yourself instead of that hands-free station, the motors on them. But those are the one things we were waiting for. Um, and we also got the cleaning sprayers that, that spray the disinfectant. It sits for 10 minutes. We have backpack sprayers for... Um, all five of the schools with multiple units at Frontier. Yeah. I was just going to say, so the next the next item on here is the safe cleaning practices. And um, each building, each building has the um, those cleaning um, equipment that does the fogging. That does the fogging and it's 10 minutes. It's a, sp um, it's a spray, not a fog, I believe, which I well, think is important because fogging is that sort of, you know, wide dispersal on everything. The spraying is a targeted spraying of the surfaces that you need to disinfect. It's 10 minutes and then it is safe. And then, but it's being left for about 14 hours before the next day. So um, I think there's plenty of time for everything to be safe. Um, addressing the health and safety of students with special needs. Meg, could you just address that? I can. I'm, I sorry, I have I've read I've read this document, but um like I said, I only got it last night. Um, I mean, I make, to, just to jump in on that, when you think about anything extra, I mean, we've, we've ordered and we set up the training for each one of our special needs programs where we, where students require extra services and how we're going to protect staff and students on each one of those scenarios. So right. you know, we've, we've absolutely set that up. And some of those students are going to be in more than the two days a week due to their um, level of disability. Um, so we've set that up as well, how we're going to do that. So okay, and, and we, do have, we do have clear face masks for teachers to wear. We have face shields for students to wear um, as well. So I think um, there's, yeah, I think we're fine on that. Okay. Then access, 
Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just wondering, is there a crisis response person that is available to focus on students' mental health and wellness during all this? Because it's going to be kind of incredibly every especially for kids with special needs to deal with all the PPE and these new protocols. Um, every building has a school psychologist, um, and in addition, a lot of these students are in um, programs that have uh, specially trained staff to be working with the students, and for some of these students, they've had staff working with them um, over the summer um, to prepare them for um, for fall learning, so I, I think, you know, and I, and I think that, that honestly, you know, a number, you know, other students may have have concerns as well, and that's all been part of the planning. Um, is the social and emotional well being of students? Um, I also think, Caroline. Caroline yep. I also think it could be also addressed as far as the special needs students. The fact that they're doing two weeks of bringing in the special needs students specifically, um, at least at Sunderland, and I'm assuming the other schools are doing it. And in slowly and with one-on-one -on -one and, you know, training with the masks and the distancing, I think that's meeting this, the special needs. Right. These needs. So I think we're, we're doing really well with that. And what you may not already know is that we've been doing those services over the summer as well. And some of those services have been in person as well for those families that wanted that. So, um, you know, Things like our health program, the high school, which, you know, uh, significantly autistic students, uh, you know, they were here in person um, or um, in some of the other in some of the other programs across the, the districts. So, you know, we've been reaching out to those more vulnerable students already, um, including those two weeks, which is a good point. Thank you. I should have said that. Um, <laughs> access to rapid testing. Um, I believe that. Um, the governor has worked with a coalition of other states to order at least 500,000 of the, um, you know, rapid testing. And the federal government actually, um, well, that was what happened to Deerfield Academy. They got bumped on the Abbott rapid test um, for the federal government's order. So in the next two to three weeks, they, they said sometime in mid-September. So it is before... Um, the schools go back in person, we should have some access to rapid testing. However, I don't know what our allocation would be and when it would come for sure. So that, I think that's a line item that we kind of next really need to look into and continue to monitor. Um, sorry, Carolyn, just one sec. Could, could um, those who aren't speaking or waiting to speak maybe mute in between there's a lot of background noise happening while it's carolyn speaking um access to i mean clear guidelines for contact tracing we have only been using um the guidelines by dph it has been successful for the last seven months i feel it is um um it is workable it is proven um and it and it is something that we can do on a already and that's what we've been doing is there any questions on that uh we have always used dph guidelines we never lessened our guidelines to the desi guidelines even when school was in session um before it closed um appropriate school nurse staffing again um it seems like we have a nurse for every building and and backup and I feel like um, this is just my own um, impression, but my impression is that there's good communication there's, between the nurses. Um, they are working together, and I feel there is good oversight. Is there anyone that had questions on that? Okay. Um, continuing on, space to isolate and monitor, monitor suspected or positive cases. Uh, of course, we're limited in space, um, but there is availability to take the students and, and keep them separate until the parents pick them up. Um, we, we do have a designated space um, yes. in, in each building. Um, uh, resources for safe transportation of students, as Darius alluded, 
only about 15% of the students will be taking the buses and he's hopefully will have that worked out uh, before the kids come back to school in the next two or three weeks. Um, safe re-entry into the school protocols. Um, the only question I had on this um, is that we, we really want the windows and doors open. And, you know, we always um, are trying to be careful with the locked doors and stuff. So Darius, could you address this, how we're gonna um, uh, be able to monitor safety of our buildings, plus keeping everything as much open as possible? Yeah, I mean, that's a there's an area there where I don't have a magic wand on that one. I mean, basically, you have more students outside, then you have more vulnerability to outside. You don't have the walls and the, and the steel doors and in the, you know, those kind of things. We're going to have to be, um, you know, actively monitoring our campuses, um, you know, to make sure that there's no um, strangers and that kind of thing on campus and reporting those and putting in procedures to reporting those if those things are happening. Um, when <laughs> thank you, Caitlin said Dobermans. Um, yes, if you have a few extra, that'd be helpful. I mean, I think it's one of those people. It, it is a true. It's a it's a fact. When you have more, if I if you walk around Frontier's campus right now, I'm just happen to be here. That's why I'm talking about Frontier more. But you know, there's a dozen tents set up. So I mean, we're going to have hundreds of students outside, and that's we didn't have that last year. And so yes, there's a vulnerability there. But we got to risk assess. What are we going to be risk assessing? If we're going to do outside learning, then people have to be outside and. Um, and we have to, um, you know, put in, while we'll our, you know, lockdown, what to do if, um, if there is an outside threat, where to go, how to, how to react on that. Um, but it's going to be something like, you know, uh, very similar to, um, I'm trying to think of the programming, um, Alice, which is basically react and run, you know, um, it's very different than crouch and hide. So if you're outdoors, it's gonna be something like that. So it's not a, it's not a pretty topic to talk about. Um, but, um, we have to give one thing to do the other, so. I think um, the Coalition to Safely Reopen Schools from the Mass Nurses Association, and that piece wasn't about how to protect the students from like an assault from outside. It was more, is there staff to be there when the students are passing between classes and entering school for the day to make sure they really have masks on and they're not like weird anti-masks? I did see when the Frontier was graduating, there was at least one kid with this mask that was like a fake mask that his nose was exposed and like there was a little screen for his mouth. So will there be people there in the mornings to make sure the students have masks on and that they're, that they're complying? Thank you, Lisa. I wasn't, I was more or less thinking of the doors being opened, but yes. Okay. So yes, yeah, straightforward. Yes. Um, the mask policy will be enforced, and um, as we greet students during the day, they'll make sure that they're wearing their masks. And students who are not compliant will will be. Um, we have a, a policy that states such, but um, we will work with them to wear masks. And if it's going to be a protest, then they can they will be going home. Um, and while it's a First Amendment issue, and I'm sure someone will sue somebody over this. Um, I'm going to protect the, the people in the school. They will follow the mask policy or they won't be here. Um, and I've asked the boards of health to vote um, as well to back us up that the, you know, by voting our mask policy as a statement from the board of health as well, just as an extra level of, you know, this is how we're, you know, we require businesses to do it. We can require a school to do it. Um, and so uh, the Deerfield Board of Health, this is for the Deerfield Elementary and the Frontier Regional High School. The Deerfield Board of Health voted to um, be sure that uh, masks were required. So Darius has 100% backing from the Deerfield Board of Health already. Um, comprehensive education and training of staff prior to reopening. Darius did allude to this and talk about this a bit, but just to reemphasize, there is, I think it was extremely important to have proper PPE training to, to put the masks on and put on proper um, PPE, but also to take it off, to take it off safely. And, um, you know, that has happened. And um, I, I feel like it is adequate, but um, we will have uh, our training for the EDS volunteers online. And um, we could refer to that. So, to, you know, people have that ability. And just so you know, I mean, one of the, I'm just going to add that one of the things that we put in our training for staff was something from the um, New England Public Health Institute, uh, one of their training modules on standard precautions and, and hand washing. 
um, as a, in addition to um, a donning and doffing PPE um, video that was produced um, by Boston University for the school health unit. For, oh, Fran is asking what checklist this is. Fran, um, this is a document that um, from the Massachusetts Nurses Association. Um, it's a, a position statement, I guess, a uh, coalition to re safely reopen schools um, have this position st uh, statement. So that's what Carolyn is referring to. I think it was, I'm not sure how it was distributed. Um, Fran, I can forward you the um, what Lisa had sent me. Lisa Midlands had sent me, if you would like. I just um, put the, the link in the chat. It, it just came out August thirty first. It's a they they put out a position paper. It's a coalition to safely reopen schools that includes uh, many different groups. So the link is right there in the chat. Thank oh. you very much. That's good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just going to note that in about two minutes, I'm going to have to jump off because I do have a 1.30 meeting um, okay, that I well, need to be prepared for. Well, well done, but I felt that this was really important to address. Um, the disparities in access to in-person learning. I'm, I, I know that Darius was, um, is trying to make sure everybody has access to, um, you know, Chromebooks and, and um you know, internet access and is trying to work that out. Um, there are, yeah, there are there are plans in place for the schools and some of those plans include having space in the school for students who maybe are in the remote model but have issues with um, connectivity in terms of uh, internet access that they would have a, a safe space um, where they were able to, um, to work. Um, as well as other students who maybe didn't have the same supports at home. So that's that's a, that's happening. The, the, we're calling them the internet cafes, Darius. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the devices are, um, there are devices for all students. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a shortage of devices right now. We've ordered them and they're sitting on a dock in China. Um, and so, so it's kind of a, it's a problem across the state, but we had enough devices to get through the spring. Um, we're going to have to rely on some families using their devices and such. Was, yeah, that was a question, Darius. I was I was meant to ask you offline, or wasn't sure who to ask. You know, so so if, if my son has a MacBook, can he use that? He also has a school one. Could he give the school one back so you could give it to some other person who needs it? And could he use his own MacBook? So it gets kind of we it gets private. Um, technically, yes. But okay. technically, no. Basically, our problem is that we we are one to one in the middle and high school, so we have yep. enough devices for, for the entire building. Um, okay. The devices that are older that were supposed to be replaced, they're just going to issue those until the replacements come in October. The yep. problem is in the elementary schools. Not every school, elementary school is one to one, and I so see. in the spring they were able to. We had enough devices, and we even you know shared some amongst across some of the buildings um, to make sure every kid who needed one got one. Um, yeah. But we were supplemented by um, those families who had devices at home and didn't need them. Yeah. As the kind of the year went on, people were like, well, I, life would be easier if my child got a Chromebook as well because they were using the family computer and I'm working from home. And, you know, we had yeah. to share and that kind of stuff. So more and more devices went out. So um, your son being at Frontier, is, is, yeah. you know, not taking a device. I mean, you can ask, but... Um, there's enough devices overall at Frontier. Okay. Because we already had the infrastructure the, yep. the, uh, thing. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, did anyone else have any concerns about that? Um, okay. Then moving on, just the last item on the list was preserving school staff pay and benefits. I think we're all trying to do the best we can. Um, I think this finishing out this year, um, 2020, you know, fiscal year 21 is not going to be an issue, but I think we're all concerned about fiscal year 22, which is upcoming budget year, and there's just nothing we can do. I mean, right now, uh, school budgets are unsustainable long term already, so this additional stress is not good for any of us, but we are doing everything we can to cover costs with COVID money. When we when it is available, and I'm I'm hoping that we'll be able to limp through. Darius, I don't know if you want, had anything else you wanted to add on that. He's, he, 
Yeah. I mean, the additional grant money we got has been very helpful to help us get us through the initial surge here. Um, you know, it's interesting as I was on with the commissioner on Wednesday and, you know, budget season starts in October for those of you guys who also deal with budgets. Yay. Um, but it looks like absolute awful for next year. So you have the, you know, us, you know, having to spend some of our reserves in order to get this thing off the ground um, with next year on the horizon. Um, I am worried about it. Um, we have enough to get the PPEs and all the kind of basic stuff through the grants and the HVAC repairs, but um, you know, all the staffing issues and that kind of stuff, it's going to get, it's going to get tricky as the year goes on. Um, so is there any questions before Meg leaves? Quickly. Thank you, Meg, for hanging in there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, All right. I'm going to, I'm going to sign. I don't know how that works. If I sign out, Darius, if I start. Okay. I'm All right. Listen, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I think it's really important that we um, continue to have an opportunity to meet. So rather than because of the multiple meetings that we all attend, um, if anyone feels like they need um, a meeting, then I think we should contact Darius and we should um, have another four board of health, four town board of health to stay on top of all these issues. <laughs> Everything changes so rapidly. Um, and, and, and if we have concerns, I think we should be able to talk about it as much as possible. So why don't we leave it instead of setting up a, you know, a concrete meeting date, why don't we just leave it up that if anyone is concerned, reach out to Darius, please let them know, let him know that we need to set up a meeting and we'll just post another meeting. It has to be posted. So it can't be like, let's call tomorrow, but we have, if we can post it for the, within the 48 hours, I think it's really worth it. Is there anyone commenting on that? Caitlin? or Varik, or um, Carl, or Marie, are you okay with that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, let's just leave it then. Um, oh, I think that's Darius. great. All right, Darius, if we have any issues, we'll let you know and we can pull a meeting together, okay? Oh, Varik, okay, I'll just take it that you are agreeing with this. All right, thank you, everybody. Have a thank wicked you. good weekend, have a wicked good weekend. Hey, you, you too, thank you, everybody.